Welcome, everyone, to the latest monthly installment of the EFF Austin Meetup. My name is uh, Kevin Welch. I'm the current president of the board at EFF Austin. Hello to old and new faces uh, in person and online. Um, yeah, so um, if you're new and you're like, what is EFF Austin? Well, as you might guess, we are an Austin-based digital civil liberties organization. We've been around for almost 30 years. I haven't been around that long. We work closely with Electronic Frontier Foundation based out of San Francisco. They're the nation's oldest and largest digital civil liberties advocacy group. You can sort of think of them as the uh, ACLU for the internet. They work to protect your rights in emerging technological spaces, especially your First and Fourth Amendment rights to free speech and privacy against unreasonable search and seizure. They protect things like net neutrality, end-to-end encryption, uh, Section 230 of the CDA, and all sorts of things that allow you to express yourself uh, in with new forms of technology, especially, you know, um, I had something smart I was going to say there. It's been a day. You'll bear with me. Normally, I'm a little more polished. Anyway, um, yeah, so they've been around 30 years. They're awesome. They fight for you every day. Give them your money. Volunteer for them. Um, we've been around almost as long. We are the oldest member of what's known as the EFA, or the Electronic Frontier Alliance. It's a group of about 100 affiliate groups who don't have any formal legal association with EFF, but we kind of engage in peer-to-peer -peer activism with them. We're based all over the country, although we're the only one in Austin and actually the only one in Texas, so we have to cover a lot of ground, especially since uh, Texas certainly has its fair share of laws at the state. We have to uh, politely give our thoughts on, basically. Um, we are primarily, compared to National EFF, an educational organization. It primarily takes the form of these monthly meetups, which we currently do on the second Tuesday of every month here at Capital Factory. Normally, we're downstairs on the first floor. We're up here on the eighth floor tonight. Uh, thank you for finding your way here. I tried to make it as clear as possible. Um, but yeah, so we mainly do the meetups, although we do sometimes engage in uh, local and state-level political advocacy. We were prominently involved in the fight the city was having over bringing back automated license plate readers. While we couldn't talk the city out of bringing them back, we did manage to convince them to not retain data for 30 days like they originally wanted. We got it down to seven, so we are very happy about that. It's not enough, but it's progress. Um, also, in this last legislative session, we gave feedback on a number of things, especially I testified uh, against the big uh, HB4 data privacy bill, not because it was actually a bad bill, it just didn't go far enough. So we officially have on the record ways we hope they will be improving it in coming legislative sessions. Um, we've also been known to occasionally throw really cool uh, cyberpunk parties whenever we can find eccentric millionaires to give us money. So if you know any, send them our way. Um, so yeah, um, so yeah, so as I said, um, I try to announce what we have coming on the upcoming slate, so I'll give a brief little preview of that. I actually do have the next several months booked out. So um, after our talk this month, um, got a bit of we basically been having a number of pretty famous speakers a number of these recent talks. Last month, we were honored to have renowned cryptographer and EFF board member Bruce Schneier join us remotely. Um, in December, we're going to actually be joined by one of the co-founders of Anaconda, Peter Wang. So we're going to get to hear his thoughts on the implications AI is going to have on uh, digital civil liberties. I'm sure it will be very uh, enlightening. I encourage you to come to that one. Um, also, in January, I'm very excited that I actually, at the uh, recent International Association of Privacy Professionals meetup, I made a connection with um, a very brilliant um, woman who's a lawyer who's originally from Russia, who's actually an expert on the way Moscow conducts surveillance in Moscow. So she's going to talk to us a little bit about if you're a citizen of Moscow, what is life like for you there as far as uh, government surveillance? And finally, we're going to be hearing from uh, EFF's investigative researcher, Dave Moss, in February. I, he's not committed hard to his topic for me, but it may very well be about this uh, massive surveillance tower in Juarez you might have heard something about. So we're going to be talking about that. So that's what I know we have booked up. We may um, try to do some sort of like holiday meetup gathering that's purely social. Um, I'm still figuring out the details of that. My bandwidth's kind of tight right now, but stay tuned if I can throw something together. We also usually do something during South by Southwest, although as I said, bandwidth is somewhat constrained at the moment, so we will see. But anyway, that is what we have coming up. So. You've heard me ramble enough, so without further ado, I'm going to give an intro to our speaker, and I will let him take things from here. So um, we're very honored to uh, have 
Owen McNally uh, returning to speak to us again. I think this is at least his third time speaking to us. Um, we're always happy to have Owen back. We always learn a great deal. But to for those of you who have not met Owen yet, I will give you his quick bio. Owen McNally is a professor, researcher, and technology analyst in Austin, Texas. And he's also a director of collaborations and events at the National Cyber Watch Center. He also uh, leads EFF Austin Cybersecurity Working Group Initiatives. Um, an enduring theme in his work is an evaluation of technologies for usability, quality, and ethics based on humanistic principles. He holds an interdisciplinary PhD from the University of Texas at Austin with a program of work in medical cognitive science. He's taught college-level software design, cognitive studies, psychology, research methods, and statistics for the behavioral sciences. In recent years, his work has been in cybersecurity readiness, hospital software, modeling of COVID dynamics in populations, software designing usability, risk and analysis and researching investment opportunities in AI, neurotechnology, logistics, and other sectors. So, um, you know, I'm not going to give too much of this away, but I guess I'll just say that, you know, you may notice a theme in some of our recent talks where, you know, AI, this thing you might have heard a little about, is in the news a lot lately. It's changing everything, for better and for worse, or for Nobody can say how. All we know is it's the most transformative thing since the mobile phone, maybe even the internet. Like, you know, and I'm a big believer in when a t big technological phase shift comes around, it's imperative that we all learn about it as much as we can because like it or not, stuff's going to change. And hopefully we can change it in a positive direction the more we understand it. So in particular, Owen's going to be talking to us what he sees as the ways AI is going to change how we're going to have to do cybersecurity going forward. So without uh, further ado, why don't you take it away, Owen? Oh, it's... So uh, what I want to do is kind of keep this pretty loose and definitely want to get questions and observations just, you know, uh, I'm, I'm doing this based on a workshop that I created that uh, I want to have a go live for in a few months, uh, early next year, I think, at a conference. And any feedback, criticism, making, making points, um, that uh, you think might be interesting or helpful, just err on the side of, of mouthing off and speaking up, please. So I've been thinking about this stuff for a number of years now, and uh, uh, Kevin and I and a couple other of our EFF Austin colleagues uh, met. We even looked at the possibility of creating a startup probably five years ago, applying machine learning methods to cybersecurity, and um, that whole thing has taken off in a really, really big way. Okay, There's a lot going on. Uh, I have to say that the last year when uh, GPT seemed to have hit a kind of a new threshold of power, it's really been remarkable. It's been a very, very remarkable period in the last year. Just was November 2022 that it really hit hard. And then the, the advances this year have just been crazy. I, I, I think it is actually artificial intelligence this time. I think it passes the Turing test. I really do. I've never thought that until this year. So there's a lot going on, and I've n I have not seen a period where virtually every meeting I go to, almost every single day, people are talking about AI. I've never seen so much of a convergence in the scientific and technical communities on this topic. Yes? What sort of applications There's so many. There's so many. I mean, ha you know, have it write a textbook for you. Um, you know, it just it, there's it's all over the place. It's 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 as I'm, it's go I'm going to mention. It's not one thing. It's many many different things, with the use cases further along in some fields than others. But in terms of it being a a cognitive amplifier, productivity maximizer, it's like nothing I've ever seen. It we really do live in the future. Okay, so we're going to go into it. We're going to look at some particular use cases that uh, both people who are defending data and defending networks from bad actors are using, and then what the bad actors can do um, as we kind of enter a, an era of something like an arms race. But first, I am going to give a dedication here to uh, a man who uh, would have been here, I think, and he would have had the most amazing insights because he always had the most amazing insights. 
uh, just uh, a, a month ago, uh, the AI and technical communities lost one of the, the just a, a person who was a force of nature named Daniel Mahler. He was uh, one of my very best friends. He died peacefully, very unexpectedly. I think the last time I saw him was actually either in this room or upstairs. He was giving, holding forth, doing a, a talk on AI, and there was not a single chair in the room. There, there, it was standing room only at that point. He was that well regarded. Some of y'all here got to meet him. Many of you did not. Um, but I dedicate this, this event to uh, this lovely, lovely, brilliant man who's one of the smartest people I ever met. And uh, may his memory be a blessing. So I'm going to start this with a big idea. This is going to be the, the thing I'm, I want to have kind of um, integrate all the other pieces here tonight. And the big idea is that I think this development, these developments, plural, what we've seen in the last year and where we're going, it's actually giving me room for being a little bit more hopeful about what is otherwise a pretty depressing situation with regards to cybersecurity, which has just gotten worse since I started uh, you know, doing research in this field in the last, you know, maybe seven years or something like this and, and contributing to the National Cyber Watch Center and, and EFF Austin in this domain. It seems, it seems like things are getting worse. And I can see, though, the possibility that artificial intelligence is actually going to give an advantage to the quote-unquote good guys. And what I mean by that is the United States and our allies. So there's a definitely a major context here about statecraft and who our friends are and who our rivals are and the possibility that our opponents are actually enemies at this point. Certainly some of the criminal organizations, I think we could, we could say, are enemies of peace and order. So it's possible that the historic advantage America has with regards to AI is going to see us through to flip the script about cybersecurity, because the, the big idea I've been working with in recent years on is, is that the bad guys are on offense and the good guys are on defense. And we're constantly reacting to innovations, improvements, new ideas coming from criminal organizations and the, their sponsors who are state actors. We're, we're constantly reacting. And then they're, they're trying something new, per, and, and then we're reacting again. It's, been, it's just felt like this, that's all it's been for the most part, for at least the last five or seven years or something. This may flip that. We may actually be able to have a, what you would call in game theory, a first mover advantage. Reason is, is because artificial intelligence comes from the United States. And other... Uh, allies of ours in the Anglosphere and in, in uh, countries like Germany, countries like Japan, South Korea, and some others are part of the broader network of our uh, allies and partners, and they've also been developing AI. And it's not, it takes non-trivial amounts of investment and time, and people who have a, a see a long-term advantage to spending money now that you may not see the return on investment for an, in, a, in a tight time cycle. We've had that. We really had a peak of it, I think, in the, in the 50s and 60s, if you look at federal uh, investment in basic research. And out of that came just so many things like the internet and artificial intelligence, so many other things that people didn't know how big it was going to be at the time when they spent millions, and eventually billions of dollars. And we have... Uh, uh, seen fantastic innovations come from this country and our allies. So I think we've got a first mover advantage. I could be wrong about that. It could be that some of our uh, rivals or opponents are, are further along, and that, that may not be true. I, I can't say as a fact this is true, that I think we have a first mover advantage. So AI could turn this deteriorating uh, or at very least stagnating cybersecurity situation around. I, I think it's certainly possible. Okay. 
generally, so uh, generally, I've been kind of pessimistic about this stuff for the, the reason I've been mentioning here that I've just felt like the, the good guys, the defenders of networks, the people who keep our lights on, keep the hospitals running in this country, have been on the defensive for years. Whereas the, the black hats, the, the bad actors, have been innovating or sandboxing, to use the term from software development. They keep trying new things, and they've got more money. People pay off the ransom uh, in a ransomware attack, then they've got more money, then they've got, they're incentivized to try new things out. Um, I had a cybersecurity expert, uh, academic uh, colleague of mine up in Pennsylvania mention uh, he was doing consulting for a, a hospital up there, and he said the, the level of sophistication he's seen this year with some of the uh, hacker tactics is unlike anything anyone's ever seen in this field before. We don't know whether that's because that, of, of them using AI or not. I think that's an extremely important thing I want to learn about. I've so far not really found a thought leader who can address the specific questions. For instance, is the Chinese government's, um, are, there, are there hackers actively using AI to, uh, on, to be on offense currently? I just don't know. And maybe they're, it's a, in a research trial stage, or maybe they're, they're much further along. I don't, I don't know. Um, if there's a thought leader in this space you know of, please let me know who that is. Make an introduction if you can, because I'm definitely embracing the learning curve on this stuff. So when, you, when you're thinking about like offensive AI cybersecurity applications, like what like examples of what you're thinking of, or is it just still so conceptual that you're still trying to figure out where the IP yeah, just plugs in? Okay, so the question here is like, what are some specific examples of AI applied to offensive cybersecurity? Uh, we'll go through some of these, but I'll just mention that the one that worries me the most right now is how sophisticated uh, generative AI can be at creating emails that will make people think this is a real person who I met at a conference and I kind of forget who they are again. Who, you know, I met 37 people, but this looks legit. So I'm going to click on this guy's link and then boom, ransomware that, that, so that attack surface would be one, one of uh, several examples that we're going to look at here. So, you know, uh, again, there's a, there's a, uh, statecraft backdrop to what's happening right now. We were way past the era of, hacker groups being um, kind of marginal in the world of statecraft. At this point, I think uh, the, the three governments that we have the biggest problems with are, are very actively pioneering research in both, on both offense and defense. Uh, Russia, I think, um, maybe most prominently, we, I do not know nearly as much as I want to about what the Chinese are doing. It's not the easiest thing to really get you know, intel on. There's a lot of talk about it. So let me just back up for a second and address what AI is and what AI is not. I'm not going to delve into the controversy about where the borders are between true artificial intelligence versus mere automation. It's been pointed out a long time ago that stuff in the 1950s that was considered artificial intelligence. Years later, people say, oh, that's just algorithms. That's just automation. But in 1957, it, that was not how they thought. So like chess programs at this point, in 1957, that was the leading edge of AI. I don't think people think of that as much now, you know, your average chess program. But I'm really not going to address this vexed issue of like where the boundaries of AI are. It's, it's, um, we'd be here all night talking about it, maybe another time. AI is not one thing. So I've been doing research on it for more than 30 years. Um, I got to sit in on the class of one of the original developers of it in the 1950s, Herbert Simon, who's a great guy. His version of it, knowledge-based AI, you would see on the left on the screen here, that is uh, some code that a, uh, a friend of mine who was working in the area of medical AI sent me when I was uh, trying to finish my, my PhD work. Um, that is what you might call knowledge-based AI on the left. And it has a long history. It goes back to you know, the birth of computer science. 
pretty much. Um, maybe 1956, I think, is what some people would say was the year zero. There's a, a particular conference at Dartmouth where the, the elder gods were, were there in the flesh. On the right is this alternative paradigm that has taken the world by storm in recent years, the last 10 years especially. We would call this an artificial neural network. And the, the, all the, the rage, raging uh, interest in generative AI, in large language models, in what GPT is doing, is based on the technology on the right. This is inspired by the structure of the human brain. Now, most neurobiologists have never found it a very convincing simulation, really, though it's gotten really interesting in recent years. But it, was, it, just, it wasn't supposed to be a, necessarily a literal model of how the brain works, more a, an, a, an engineering approach that's inspired by uh, neurons, and each of those circles would be a kind of artificial neuron, and you would feed data into the... Uh, green neurons, which would represent a kind of like world accessing uh, set of processors. And then you've got various intermediate layers and you've got an output layer, like you see on the far right there, that purple dot. And this has also been around since the 1950s. And these two different branches of AI have at times come together. At times they've diverged again. They've uh, been rivals for funding. There are some people who would embrace hybridizing them, which is poss certainly possible in an, an area of active research. But the, the, the technology on the right is the thing that in the last 10 years has really kind of blown up and just, uh, it just seems to be revolutionizing so many different things in the world right now. But it's not the only game in town. There's many, many different technologies that are, you know, labeled as AI, and then people say, is that really AI or not? And that, that's not a debate I'll have tonight. But, you know, if you buy me a beer, okay, then we can go down that rabbit hole. Okay. Where are we at? It's the year 2023. What's going on? Look at it from the point of view of business. Follow the money, as uh, Woodward and Bernstein supposedly said, and that's it's, it's too good to fact check whether they actually – said, follow the money. They did in the movie version um, about the Watergate uh, inv investigations. I don't know that they did in real life. But it's, it's too good to not be true. Follow the money. If you want to see what's going on, look at the deals. So Splunk has never turned a profit in 20 years. Cisco bought them for $28 billion, or Sagan units. I like to call, to call them. Uh, Carl Sagan used to say, billions and billions. Okay, 28 Sagans. That's 28,000 million. At some point, we're talking about real money here. Okay, we'll see if Cisco gets their money's worth. Well, you know, but they're making a bet, aren't they? That someone's making a big bet that this thing is going to be huge. Cybersecurity and AI crossing over. Morgan Stanley, um, the, uh, I guess, finance group, um, investment banking. What is Morgan Stanley brokerage? All the above? All the above. Okay. Um, what don't they do? Um, they have a link to a report on there by an analyst, and you take these things for what they are. It's a, it's a prediction about the future. Does anyone go back and check? Did that analyst make a good prediction? Well, maybe not, but I'll say what's in interesting, by the way, in the, uh, uh, the rationalist and less wrong scene that I'm kind of in the outer orbit of, and uh, other people are doing prediction markets, and they're getting really, really scientific about prediction and checking their own predictions once a year and seeing who was right, and, you know, giving scorecards on this stuff, you know. So um, a good analyst would want to join that community and say, hey, here, here was my prediction from five years ago or something like this. So is it true that by 2030, this is going to be a $135 billion market? We'll find out. Some Someone will check. Maybe it'll, maybe it'll be... A reasonable estimate. Yes. Why did they pay twenty billion? What was the value that they saw in Splunk? Since a lot of people felt that they were the dinosaur of the data center. Uh, people felt Splunk were the dinosaur in the data center, and yet Cisco paid twenty-eight billion dollars for them. Uh, they're high on hype. 
they're drunk on expectations of future profits. They think this is where the market's going. They're skating to where the hockey puck will be, to use a you know sports metaphor. That's my best guess. They they thought this was too big not to have a big to be really going in really big on. I guess my assumption was is that they paid that much because they have all of the historical data from all the large enterprises around events and the, the methods used, like kind of historical. That's a that's an interesting uh, observation. Maybe it's fundamentally worth paying that much because of how much data they have, and then you can do a lot of things when you have really really big data scores stores. Yeah, I mean maybe maybe it was fundamentally about the data and not the technology. Besides the data, I I don't know. Um, anyone have any observations on that? Yes. By the time you know what it's worth, it's too late to get in. By the time you know what it's worth, it's too late to get in. I mean, maybe what it is is you you spend that much money so your uh, rivals can't buy that company, you know. So it's like just it's 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 maybe um, strategically sound uh, by some some uh, expectation or metrics, what have you. Uh, by the way, do we have another microphone that we could we could use? Okay, um, so we could just kind of open this up and let whoever wants to ask a question like have the mic. Yeah, let's do that. And myself on that one, I guess I'll just say, you know, the more I'm learning about AI, you know, just thinking the value of a data set, even if Cisco thinks it's an unprofitable business, the data itself is valuable if only by that you can essentially make it available as a transfer learning franchise for other people. Just say, here's a big pile of data we've already trained. Now you can build on that and don't need to pay Amazon or Google or Microsoft insane amount of money for cloud services. That'd be my thought. Uh, recently, I was uh, on a webinar with the academics and with large language models using Bayesian inference and inductive probability, a concept called zero knowledge proof, which is a methodology. So is it uh, an advanced methodology of uh, as a logician? Did you want to answer that? I'll give it to him real quick. Yeah, it sounded more like an observation than a question. I'll just say I'm a big Bayes fan because I couldn't have finished my my PhD, it's, Bayes saved my life. So I'm always going to be biased to anybody who says cool things like, here's another application of Bayesian statistics and Bayesian inference, Bayesian networks. I'm always going to be going, yeah, yeah, you know. I, I, but I, otherwise, I can't speak to it. I hear about, you know, zero knowledge proofs, and it's one of those things. There's a lot of shiny objects out there. I mean, I can just add on zero knowledge proofs that, you know, they're a big, but they're highly valued in the privacy community just because they let you trust somebody without actually revealing any of your data. So, yeah, they're, they're great and have diverse applications. Did anybody else want to, all right, yeah, a couple more people want to chime on this before we move on. I just wanted to add a data point to the numbers there. So that seems like a lot. Uh, Open AI right now with their current raise is they're raising a billion dollars at a valuation of 85 billion which seems astronomical, but that's what Wall Street is paying right now for open AI shares. So 85 unicorns, wow, they're not rare anymore. Um, anybody else wanna chime in before we move on? All right, cool, bring you back to Owen, keep going. Okay, so I'm saying I'm a little bit hopeful, maybe even guardedly optimistic that the AI gap that we have because it comes from America and our allies is going to allow us to put the bad guys on the defensive. Um, maybe, maybe. Having said that, but it's, it's, it's a nice idea. Having said that, the situation has been deteriorating. I don't like to use the word crisis. It's just to, you know, when somebody says crisis, I say, hold on to your wallet. But still, I mean, you know, other people will say it, it's a, it's a crisis. If you are a, um, medium-sized and not very well-resourced hospital system and you get hit by ransomware and you can't actually run your hospital tech until you pay the ransomware, you send them you know, $3 million at Bitcoin or something like this, it's a crisis for you. And that's happening. It's been happening all over the country and gotten worse by the year. Um, as Bill, Billy Holiday said, them that's got shall get, them that's not shall lose. The big players will tend to be protected. It's people who don't have the staffing, don't have the resources, don't have the deep bench of talent 
that are uh, you know leaving their systems vulnerable. That's just the, the nature of the situation. I think it's probably going to get at least a little bit worse. There is definitely money coming from different agencies, federal agencies uh, and others on trying to get people. But as, as someone who's very deep into cybersecurity readiness, because of the work I do with the National Cyber Watch Center, it's really, really hard getting the positions filled because organizations do not want entry level people. They want people who at least have a year or something under their belt. So they're proven. So you can have a degree in cybersecurity and it's very hard to get that first job. There's not very many entry level jobs. I mean, the person who has a a hot shot with a computer science degree from MIT, that person's probably going to get hired. But, you know, what about a person with a two-year degree in this supposedly hot field where there's hundreds of thousands of unfilled positions? It's very hard to get that first job. And it's for rational reasons. Why should I pay to train that person when you can do it? And then I poach that person from you. The thing is, if everybody does this, the the first, uh, that, that, person who needs that first level job, that person never gets that job if everybody does this. Now, you know, what the Germans do, they have this thing called apprenticing. You know enough to be able to add value on the job. You're not wasting the time of a journeyman or a master level, whatever it is. Now, we do that here with electricians, HVAC, um, your plumber, and then the medical world. They, you know, they've got a, an apprenticing type model. Well, what we don't, do that here for complicated reasons. There is money for it to spend, the, to work with the feds on this. Um, it's very, very rule-based and, and a lot of forms have to be filled up. It's very high, high compliance, high paperwork. So in any event, there's, um, you can look at what some of the uh, risk analysis business people do, people who are doing underwriting, people who are looking at insurance. It's another way to follow the money. Um, so, you know, Moody's Investor Service considers industries that have a lot of vulnerability um, because of the nature of what they're doing relative to the cybersecurity situation. That's a pretty significant debt load. One way to think of this is this idea from software development that we call technical debt. Uh, organizations develop code and they go down a certain engineering path and then you, years can go by, they just haven't done all their due diligence. There could be big holes in it in terms of, um, one um, software development team I was with once, a guy told me, um, we were a small group, maybe 20 of us or something. He said, the security holes in this application are big enough to drive the entire world through. You know, So if five years later that hasn't been addressed, that's one of many ways you can accumulate technical debt. And you know, sooner or later, your numbers are probably gonna come up. So it's, it's good to see what, Organizations that are well resourced, like Moody's, or, or, or how they're assessing what types of estimations they have of the uh, the kind of precarious nature of of you know what's keeping the lights on. So, I would just say in general, the I think the right attitude to have about this, if you're in anything bigger than a tiny organization, the right attitude to have is not whether you're going to get hacked. It's when you're going to get hacked and what are the consequences. The bigger you are, the more of a target you are. The more computers you have attached to the internet, the more targets there are. The more there is an attack surface for hackers. And they may be doing this pretty randomly in the sense that, like, you could have a a thief check every single car in a parking lot at 3 in the morning just to see if anyone had one, one door unlocked. Or they may be targeting an organization specifically. And that's the thing where I mentioned the ransomware uh, uh, email uh, generator problem. Um, they're get, people are getting very good at looking at specific organizations, learning about them, They're seeing an interview with somebody, tar- and then having a generative AI write an email to that person, and that person will think it's real. And we're going to look at that particular example here in a little bit. Um, so you're going to get hacked if you're uh, of an organization of any size beyond a few people. Even, even a small law firm could get hacked, and they, don't, they feel like, well, we don't need cybersecurity. Mm-hmm. Maybe, well, you know, roll the dice, see what happens. Go, go another 10 years, you'll see what happens. So it's a question of, of when, probably, and what the results are. You may, be, you may have good luck. It's not necessarily the best uh, risk management strategy, though. 
So um, being hacked is not a quote unquote black swan. This is a misunderstood term because it's hit like kind of pop reference points as meaning a, a highly unusual impactful event. That is a huge understatement. What it means is an event that is so unusual and so impactful, you could not have possibly anticipated it. It's not like um, COVID is not an example of this. So I took epidemiology and we learned that it was a matter of when the next pandemic hit and how hard. Not So it, it, people knew it was something was going to come. We didn't know from where or what bacteria virus. You never really, you don't know that, but, but that another one, and we will have another pandemic. It could happen next year or maybe in a hundred years. We'll, we'll find out. There, there's going to be another one. That's not a black swan. A black swan would be much more like um, a UFO landing in Washington or something like this. And the, the space brothers inviting us to join the, you know, the galactic league or something like that, which is like, what? <clears throat> so, you can't spend money on everything in an organization. There's, there's, you know, you got to make choices. We live in a world of trade-offs. What are you going to spend the money on? Hiring new people? Take a chance on hiring a, a brand new person who seems smart, who has shown the ability to pass multiple choice tests, but actually has no hands-on experience. But maybe they're, they seem smart, like you could train them up fast. And, you know, they're your... Um, they're your cousin's uh, kid or something like that. Um, okay, what about poaching? Here's where people spend their money. They poach talent. They get senior level people, and grab them, offer them more money, offer them benefits like working from home and maybe shares in the company. And then people try to poach rock stars. That's really hard to do, but, but um, that, that's what's going on. So, you know, you can... Hire a team to try to penetrate your network. Get an audit done by experienced white hat hackers who you know work with companies and may have had a slightly shady past, but but there may be the the people who can tell you where your vulnerabilities are. Assuming you actually want to know, this could, of course can make you look bad in front of your boss. This, you've been running for five years with um, gigantic vulnerabilities. Maybe you would rather not know this stuff. Okay. Uh, what did somebody say? The most important issue in an, in an organization is that which can't be talked about. Maybe that's true. Okay, so that's penetration testing. What about forensics? You know, what do you do after you get hacked? You, do you have a plan in place to see what happened? What was the attack vector? What is the impact of it? I mean, you 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 hopefully will have a plan. Unlike in certain other areas of, uh, of critical infrastructure, there really, for the most part, hasn't been the use of playbooks. So with, um, you know, Austin Energy, they've got playbooks. They've got these things, uh, you know, literal documents that they can open up if, if there's a contingency. If something bad happens, you know, they will have a plan. It will at least orient them to what they're supposed to be doing, or at least some talking points in cybersecurity so far, that hasn't really been the case. It's developed from a different culture. So, so now, by the way, playbooks are exactly the kind of thing that generative AI can do. You could get GPT to write you a playbook for what happens if we get hacked, what are we going to say to our customers about this kind of thing. So, you know, there's all kinds of stuff, uh, you know, threat modeling, data backups. Um, there's many different things you can spend money on. You can't spend money on all of it. you got to decide where you're going to put your resources. There are trade-offs. I'm a, a, a fan of doing hands-on role-playing. I did a, a, a workshop a few months ago on protecting medical data from hackers. It was live action role-playing, you know, actual simulations of the kind of thing a, a team would have to be figuring out more or less in real time. Uh, it was very, very interesting. Went really well. So, other big issue, uh, other big idea here. AI is going to both help Attackers and defenders. And what I'm really trying to figure out right now is the, where the balance is. I'm guessing maybe it's defense. If I had to guess, I might say defenders are in a slightly better situation. I don't know that. That's just an impression. Anyone wants to push back on that, please, please do. Because I, I would love to just 
engaged. That's the, the, the next thing I really need to, to do a lot of research on, uh, especially in advance of, of doing uh, some more workshops and more conferences. So AI can assist information technology teams in defending against hackers and cyber attacks by providing advanced threat detection, rapidly analyzing vast amounts of network data to identify potential security breaches or unusual activity. Um, is, is the, um, are the threats we're seeing directed towards us randomly because we just have some computers on the internet or are they actually targeting us because they know who we are? They're actually looking us up as individuals and trying to, you know, compromise our systems. That you, uh, People talk about the idea of an advanced persistent threat is different than just random opportunism. You, you want to know which category, you know, the uh, unusual activity would belong to. AI can enhance predictive capabilities using machine learning algorithms uh, based on that artificial neural network technology I showed you earlier uh, to recognize patterns and predict potential vulnerabilities or attack vectors. And AI can help automate responses to common threats. Give your uh, engineers some, some uh, time to sort of maybe, maybe offload some of, the, of the, the kind of grunt work to automation along for quicker mitigation and freeing up IT personnel to focus on more complex security challenges. That is one of the great things about the AI that we have right now. It really is a, just a gigantic productivity multiplier. It's amazing, except when it's wrong, except when it's hallucinating. And what I mean by hallucinating is that if you, at least with the older versions of G GPT, you were seeing this more like the one maybe a year ago, if you said like, what was, Jesus' favorite Beatles album, it would say, well, it was you know, Rubber Soul, you know. And number two would be, you know, Sgt. Pepper's. And if you asked it, what did Joseph Stalin say at his Nobel Peace Prize acceptance speech? It would be like, well, Comrade Stalin said he was quite honored and moved. You know, it would, it'll, it'll hallucinate. Now, it, it's, it's way better now. GPT-4, way, 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 way better. But it's not going to be right 100% of the time. It really kind of depends on the topic domain. But again, the, the bad guys, or at least people who are attacking networks, which includes the good guys, I mean, hopefully we've got the best in the business. Hopefully we have the best network penetration people and technology. I think we probably do. That would be my guess. I'd hate to be wrong on this. Hackers and cyber criminals and others, you know, the white hats, the good guys, can use AI to conduct sophisticated cyber attacks by automating the discovery of vulnerabilities in networks and systems, enabling them to exploit weaknesses at unprecedented speed and scale. May you live in interesting times. AI can be used in social engineering attacks, like creating convincing phishing emails uh, that are tailored to individuals or impersonating individuals by analyzing large amounts of data to tailor deceptive messages more effectively. And AI algorithms can be employed to develop malware that adapts to defensive measures, making it more difficult to detect and counteract. If you didn't have uh, enough things to worry about already, worry about malware. For the longest time, there was this concept that we hoped would not come to pass called the zero day exploit. That means a vulnerability is found and the bad guys, or, or, or maybe our guys, okay, who knows uh, who, who's doing this. A vulnerability is found and the same day it's found, they have an exploit around the vulnerability. And on the dark web, people send each other cryptocurrency and they buy knowledge about very about vulnerabilities that have been found. If the security teams don't know about those vulnerabilities, then they can't come up with a patch for them. What if it's um, Christmas Eve and most of the security people are enjoying themselves, the fruits of their 60 hour a week jobs, and then they've got the junior level staff running the skeleton crew. What happens at four in the morning? Maybe that's a good time to, for um, a very sophisticated kind of new type of cyber attack to occur. Um, if there's no patch, how long is it going to take them to get an emergency patch together? Microsoft has gotten way better, I will say. I used to just really despise their software when I would work as a kind of an IT technician. They've just gotten better on many things. Um, and they come up with patches pretty fast now. 
they're, they're, they've gotten a lot better. They, they take it very seriously in a way that I don't, I don't think they did 20 years ago. So AI can assist hackers in identifying zero-day vulnerabilities by rapidly analyzing software code or network systems to detect previously unknown weaknesses. So uh, a few of us uh, at EFF Austin, uh, we collaborated with Travis County um, in for the 2020 elections. And we were hoping that they were doing all the right things with regards to the security of the voting machines. And we we're also just hoping they could keep the, um, the websites and social media going so there was no misinformation or disinformation from someone who might want to spread fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Bud. Okay. Uh, a certain very large uh, country, or more than one, may want to interfere with our elections. It's just spread chaos. And we actually use what's called open source intelligence tools, and we analyzed the, um, what we could find out about the software that the county uh, uh, servers were using. We found out all kinds of things. It was, it's all public information if you use the right tool. I'm talking about one called Maltigo. It was kind of alarming. Now, you know, we were trying to help the county. Um, we met with them, and we had a very productive meeting with them, with their their cybersecurity team. And you know, we we thought, wow, these guys are actually really smart. But um, we could have not. We could have been someone else. We could have been, you know, chaos actors who wanted to screw up the elections. And and we found out some very interesting things. I'll just put it that way. Oh, go ahead. There's 254 counties in Texas. And I would imagine Travis County is one of the more sophisticated ones on this sort of thing. So there have to be a lot that aren't over 200, I would imagine. I would imagine that just from a budget standpoint would be an accurate statement. Yeah, I think we would be more of a target than, you know, Bayer County, but who knows, you know? I mean, yeah, that, it may be that they go, they fish where the fish are. You know, we'll find that that's what they do with hospital with regard to hospitals and ransomwares. They they don't necessarily go after Cedar Sinai or Johns Hopkins or the UT medical system. I mean, they they might try, but you know, they'll have better results with a you know eight thousand bed uh, rural hospital system that's got like two cybersecurity people, one of which needs to get retrained, the other one of which is uh, is about to have a baby, and you know she'll she'll be offline for a while. That that's who you want to go after. So um, once, once a vulnerability is found, AI can help in automating the, the uh, creation of an exploit. So there's vulnerabilities and there's exploits. What's the time lag between these? If they can speed that up, that's a problem, leading to worst case scenario, which we see now is the zero day exploit. Maybe it's 72 hours before Microsoft announces that they've got a patch and they got to get the word out and then you've got to install the patch and maybe the patch is the right one, and maybe it's not. Sometimes the patch can introduce a new vulnerability. And, you know, that's the thing. If, if, they're, if, if they're, the operational tempo of their research is faster than the operational tempo of what defenders are doing, then that's, what's, that's the kind of thing that happens. So once a vulnerability is found, AI can help in automating the creation of a complex exploit tailored to leverage these vulnerabilities effectively and evade detection. Uh, here in Austin, home of the SolarWinds Corporation, two miles down the road, the word on the street, and this is pure gossip, okay, let's just treat this as pure gossip, but the rumor is that an intern used the password 1234 on one of the computers there, and a Russian group, I think it was Cozy Bear, I think it was a Russian hacking group, Cozy Bear, uh, you know, use the internet that their computers are exposed to the internet. They cracked that code and uh, it was months before anyone found that this had happened. SolarWind software was used by many, many different U S federal government agencies as well as Microsoft. Um, all these companies were affected, probably the worst data breach incident in federal government history. That's just two years ago. I think is when that was roughly, um, it wasn't long ago. So um, what if they, they don't even detect this problem for a couple months? Now, now you've really got a problem. You, you can't do a patch until unless you know what the vulnerability was. AI can optimize the timing and methods of attacks, ensuring maximum impact by analyzing 
when systems are more, most vulnerable or least monitored, thereby increasing the chances of a successful exploit. You know, what's going on during the Super Bowl? That might be a good time to see who's napping, you know. And GPT is awesome. Be the first to say that, including for bad guys. So it shouldn't tell me the answer to this query. If it's been constructed correctly, it's got guardrails. So it, it shouldn't tell me the answer to this extremely dangerous question. What Python code would compromise ports on computers used by uh, Epic Health Records, which is the biggest provider of electronic health records? This would potentially be a disastrous thing if GPT gave you the truth. These things have been trained by ethicists and others. There's their guardrails. There's things it won't do. Okay, it, it knows people want to go after the nuclear power plants. It's not going to tell you anything. The problem is there's versions of this that have been, quote, unquote, you know, they're, they're jailbreak versions of this. They're ones that, that don't have these protections on it. So, you know, we, we don't know where this is going. Uh, I don't know that the advantage that we've got um, America and our allies will last. I think we've got a, a, a short-term advantage. I was one of the people who signed that petition to stop the development of GPT to have a pause. Um, I just, there's a bunch of us, you know, academics and uh, technologists that are like, whoa, this, this one, this is getting out of control. This is just, it's getting too smart, too fast. Uh, but one of the smartest counter arguments I heard was against a, a brilliant friend of mine who said, the problem with that is that if you pause for six months, the Chinese don't pause for six months. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong to have signed the petition. So, Here's what I really worry about. So, you know, let's say you're, um, you're Michelle, you're a director in some company. Um, you're in, let's say you're in healthcare IT. That's the, the, the part of cybersecurity I know by far the best like, as, a, as a practitioner is stuff to do with. No. Uh, maybe the battery might be. I can enunciate. I'm a singer in a band. All right. Might be good again. All that uh, tech learning you've been doing really helped just now. Okay. Try turning off the on, the on button. Yeah. Okay. So let's say you're a woman who's a, a, a director in the healthcare IT industry, and um, you know you go to a lot of conferences. You get this email. Good morning, Michelle. Kevin Jackson here. We met at the HIMSS conference a few months ago and had coffee after your talk. Really good talk, by the way. And HIMSS, by the way, I used to work with them. That's the Healthcare Information Management and Systems Society. It's the largest nonprofit in the kind of healthcare IT standard setting. It is a very profitable nonprofit. Interesting how that works. They claimed when COVID hit and they had to cancel their huge conference, it was right before South by Southwest. It was a huge... They, People lost millions of dollars because they spend the whole year planning to be at HEMS. And uh, they were really mad at the conference organizers for not having insurance or whatever. And the, conference, the head of HEMS or one of them said, oh, it was a black swan. No one could have possibly foreseen this. It's like, no, no, you should have. It's your job, someone's job. Um, at least South by Southwest admitted they just were completely unprepared. They didn't fake like it was you know, a cosmic event or something. It's just a low probability, high impact event, which is not a black swan. So we talked about ransomware and the problem of algorithms your team has been using that have high false flag rates. Like you go into your spam folder, you're like, oh God, I needed that email. That, I, now I look like a total jerk for not responding to them. That have high false flagging rates when scanning emails. As I mentioned, we've built a Python-based AI and machine learning app that is best of breed in scanning emails for ransomware by reducing false positive detection rates. Can we phone chat or Zoom sometime and uh, see if it's a good fit for your hospital system? Also, I can come to your town and do an IRL pitch for you and your team. Best, Kevin Jackson, founder and CTO of eSystems. 
you know, yeah. Michelle's looking at this and think, well, I was at the, I was at the Hems conference, Kevin Jackson. I, I met 37 people and that's before I was drinking, you know, uh, the reception afterwards, like Kevin Jackson, this is a, just, uh, well, I'll just click on this link and just see, you know, if their stuff is any good. <laughs> that's, that's what I'm worried about is using generative AI to generate something targeting an individual like that. So, um, and in fact, th this might go into a spam folder because it's generated by AI and a, a good ransomware de uh, detector would actually flag that, but may maybe it's a real person. That's the problem. And that this may be the person with the solution you want and you end up getting a false, a false positive result. And so with, with, in statistics, we have what we call confusion matrices when you do some kind of test. You have um, true positives and true negatives and false positives and false negatives. You may correctly figure out that that's um, a, a scam um, or you may not see it or you may falsely think it's a scam when it's a legit person or you may actually truly realize, oh, that, that's a real person. You know, so there's, there's four states you can be in there. So I, that's really... A, Basically, all I have to say about this stuff at this point. Um, there's many more things that could be said, but you know, uh, I think we'll we'll maybe move on to some some Q and A on this. So, may you live in interesting times. Okay, seeing cars drive themselves around town without anyone in it—that that's just like we live in the future. The first time I saw that one of those, I was just like, "Am I really seeing this?" I'd heard about people talking about it. Um, a homeless dude told me he saw a cop pulling one of those self-driving cars over. <laughs> you know, uh, sir, can I see your identification? I mean, does the cop have an app? I mean, how do they, how do they, um, so this, it, it, it adds to the feeling, the surreal feeling that I've had, um, for many of these years. And the, the, the AI really is kind of making me wonder if it's possible that the, the singularity is near. Okay, so I will only mention this in passing, but one of the most discussed ideas in the last, say, 20 years or something is associated with the writer named Werner Ving. Ving? How do you pronounce his name? Ving? And was it fiction that singularity is near? Was it, was it fiction or not? Anyone know? So it's an essay he wrote basically saying that there could be an inflection point where artificial intelligence just has a super acceleration and it becomes dramatically more intelligent than us very, very quickly. And all we will know is that things feel really weird when that moment happens. Um, I don't think it's happened, um, but I have to say I, things feel pretty weird. Okay. So um, just to summarize all this, okay, bad actors have been improving, improvising, and generally keeping us in react mode. AI could turn that around. We likely... I, I hope, enjoy a first mover advantage in applying AI to cybersecurity. I think that's true. I hope it's true. AI can assist in providing advanced threat detection, enhancing predictive capabilities, developing machine learning algorithms to recognize patterns or to predict potential vulnerabilities or attack vectors, automating responses to common threats and more, things that are going to help security. I, it's, I'm, I'm not talking about 10 years from now. I mean, people are, are, are selling these products now. I don't know how good they are, but there are an awful lot of people hustling in this space right now and trying to, trying to sell products. I don't know, you know, who would be the best in it. I, I couldn't tell you, honestly. Um, AI can assist hackers in identifying zero day vulnerabilities in conducting sophisticated cyber attacks by automating the discovery of vulnerabilities in networks and systems in more narrowly tailored social engineering attacks that are easy to miss and in malware development and more. So the last thing I'll say here is if uh, you want to engage on this and you don't already have uh, my email, you can uh, send me email at omicnally at nationalcyberwatch.org. If you want to help with the uh, EFF Austin working group, which is not super active right now because I've just got so much going on, but we'll reboot it. If you want to have anything to do with learning, helping, teaching, we definitely want to engage with you on this. We've got a small group of people that are really, really smart. We've had, we've had some good good run on the, the, what we've done. We've gotten great introductions to people. And I am wanting to have a conference here in Austin in May 
on cybersecurity, uh, which would one track would be dealing with AI type issues. If you wanted to do a workshop, we have money for that. We get National Science Foundation money to help people build workshops. Um, we have all kinds of opportunities for learning, for teaching, for networking. Uh, we, we're uh, engaging right now with academics as well as the Texas Workforce Commission. There's the last time I checked, supposedly 60,000 unfilled cybersecurity positions in Texas. That's cybersecurity and cyber adjacent, like a database administrator or a cloud computing person. So it's not necessarily pure cybersecurity roles. So, um, you know, definitely want to get any thoughts, any questions, any feedback, criticism. Nobody likes criticism. Everybody needs criticism. Okay. Um, learning to do constructive criticism and take constructive criticism is one of those adulting life skills that, you know, you should get better at. You should become more emotionally intelligent over time. So uh, definitely want to get any observations. And thank you, Kevin, for putting this on. Well, thank you for a, a great talk, Owen. Um, yeah. I think uh, I think we can have a very interesting Q and A building on it. I will uh, kick the Q and A off, and then I'll pass the uh, microphone around. I kind of have uh, two questions for you, inspired by a bit of what you were talking about. One, with the risk of uh, phishing becoming something that even people like us who like to think we're intelligent and would never fall for are going to fall for. Um, do you basically see that we're going to have to massively accelerate the rollout of pass keys to basically kill phishing, basically? Um, it's proposed as the phishing killer. And the other question I have for you is, do you see um, AI-assisted code audits as potentially a lot of companies thinking they can cut corners using that as opposed to getting professional auditing from, say, a group like NCC Group, thereby giving a lot of companies a false sense of security that they have a more secure code base than they actually do. Okay, I'll, I'll answer that second one first because I know more about it. Um, people are definitely using AI to take every possible shortcut that you can right now. Um, so I have um, a couple of young friends who are upstairs right now, busy on their AI startup, very, very smart young guys. And they bragged to me how many people were gonna get laid off from any company organization that used their uh, AI technology. And I said, you need to have another story if you're gonna talk to investors, okay, then just that. I mean, I, they, they, wanna, they wanna know what you know, the value proposition is, but yeah, basically there's so much I mean, using AI to sort of do um, auditing rather than paying a company, yes, that's exactly the kind of thing that's happening right now. How would, that, how would the results compare? I don't know. I mean, it might be that um, AI is better than most human experts. But really what it is, it's, it's where we're seeing this go is, is um, not so much it's, – it's AI and human cognition together. It's a, the cognitive amplifier thing where subject matter experts or people who are just know enough – this is what worries me. It's the – just knowing enough to seem really, really smart and actually just kind of improvising the whole thing when there's, when, especially if there's lives at stake, that, that would make me nervous. And then the second, first question about using the rollout of um, pass keys as sort of like one of the, the new technologies that's going to help us. Do you think so? Because if you think so, I'll say yes too. Well, I'm mostly with the research I've done on, on past keys. I am cautiously sold and optimistic on them. I don't like how a lot of the implementations seem to be being tied to mandatory biometrics, even though using biometrics as the username as opposed to the password does mitigate some of my previous concerns about biometrics. That being said, past keys themselves from the research I've done do seem to not destroy most of the privacy benefits we enjoy with passwords. So, and they do seem to basically solve phishing. So, despite my reservations, I just sort of think with with phishing becoming potentially an existential crisis because of AI, if it's a phishing resistant tech, we might almost just have no other choice, especially in critical high security applications. So, I cautiously think they may be good, though I've not made my final verdict yet. EFF is cautiously optimistic about them as well, um, which is where my reasoning is starting to converge. You said crisis? I said I'm holding on to my wallet. But uh, let's, let's have a meeting and talk about it. If only there was a group of smart nerds who were concerned about these issues that we could find. A and speaking of those smart nerds, do any of them have some questions for Owen? Uh, it's an awesome conversation. Yeah. 
Hello, and we met previously, um, shortly though. Um, but yeah, exactly. Um, no, <laughs> but um, I was just coming back to the idea that I wanted to challenge the notion that we have first mover advantage, um, specifically focused on our insistence on applying biased moral guardrails to the models. Um, and you alluded to this in that the models that are jailbroken are out there in the world and they'll answer the questions. They'll tell you how to build C4. They'll tell you how to assemble nuclear weapons. Um, so if, if the good guys are only using the good guy tools without, uh, with the guardrails applied, I think that that severely hinders our first mover advantage. Huh, that actually uh, builds on uh, a thought I'd had where, you know, when you'd mentioned that, uh, you know, you'd been one of the signatories of the letter, I was at the uh, UT Good Systems Symposium, and another one of the signers of the letter was one of the keynote speakers there, and I asked her a question where I told her that, you know, morally and ethically, I absolutely supported her signing a letter asking for a pause because we there are going to be many unintended consequences with these systems. Ideally, you know, I mean... I could go on to my rant about how I think that the Pandora's box open AI is opened before it had been properly researched academically it was horrendously irresponsible, but you know, genie's out of the bottle. So what I sort of told her was, I, I think this is right, but I just don't know if it's going to actually do anything. And, and with your question there, I wasn't really so much concerned about, say, what a, a China or Russia is going to do. I was more concerned with these jailbroken models that engage in transfer learning. They're shockingly cheap to reproduce, and you don't need geniuses to do it. Um, some researchers at, I think it was UC Berkeley, basically uh, released an open source jailbreak of, I forget which one, it was Llama or Bard or something, I don't remember. They did it for literally $600. That's what I'm worried about. Yeah, and $600 is a lot in Russia. So, um, yeah, no, I think the, to the point about whether we, um, for cautionary prudential reasons, we lost the first mover advantage, that could turn out to be one of the big pivot points of the 21st century. Historians may look back on that and say, what were you thinking, given how many, uh, how sophisticated Russia is with cybersecurity? I mean, they punch up way, way, way above their weight. That, and that goes back decades. I mean, it was true just in the East Bloc in general with encryption and code breaking and computing in, in places like Bulgaria and Russia and what have you, they, they punched way above their weight. They still do. And they outsource a lot of work to criminal organizations that work with the state like Cozy Bear and other ones. So yeah, did we, we may have made a uh, catastrophic error in trying to do the right thing. There's no way to know right now. This is a black box. It's, it is a, an extraordinarily important question whether we seeded that. Um, it's also the case, and this is gossip, I've heard that no, there has not been a pause at all. It's just that was all for show, that OpenAI just said, you know, like, I don't, I don't know. Uh, we'll have this other team, you know, I don't know. I, I don't really know what the truth is about this. But if it turned out that, well, so let, let, me, let me bracket all this for a moment and make a point that, I believe my friend Daniel Mahler would make if he was here because he made this point um, here or some other room at Capital Factory, maybe the last time I saw him or the, one of the last times about four months ago, three months ago. And he, he was giving a talk on this stuff and he said he thought LLMs, large language models, were nearing the end of their period where that's where the real innovations were going to come from. He thought it was going to be something else and that this, he thought it would only be incremental I mean, it may be very impressive progress, but it's not like the gap between 3 and 2 and 3.5 and 3 and then 4 over 3.5 is insane how, how powerful 4 is. That's the, the one I use. I mean, I use 3.5 and then 4. It's so much better. But he thought that we're kind of nearing the end of that period. And that's kind of contra conventional wisdom, but he said only things I think he thought were actually true. And he's been acknowledged as a deep expert in this for quite some time, former Google data science guy. So maybe that would be another possibility here is that you can spend all this money with more data, more hidden layers, more compute, 
time. Uh, you can't really get faster chips right now, but you can, you know, that that's, we seem to have hit a plateau as far as I can tell. Limit on the new prime generate. I, I think it might be something to that effect. I mean, it's hard to get the NVIDIA chips, which I think are the best in breed for, for doing um, AI kind of stuff. So maybe that's another possibility that, we'll, that um, no one's really got, will have an advantage because we've plateaued with the stuff. It doesn't feel like it, but I mean, the uh, six month pause is over, I think, right? Didn't, didn't that just end where uh, the, the GPT-5 is about to come or 4.5? Well, I, thought I thought at least I thought that they took it seriously. I mean, am I wrong about this? Does anyone remember whether OpenAI paused or not? That's an important factual thing. Never. They never did. Okay. It, so they were they they made a they um made noises to the effect of that. Somebody said hypocrisy is the tribute that vice pays to virtue. Deep man. And and I guess um, before I hand it off, just to follow up a little more on what Owen said there, yeah, the, you know, uh, following on Mueller's comments, the bit I've been reading, the possible saving grace, quote unquote, maybe that I do think we might see some plateauing of what it can do, because a lot of the early research is indicating that all its current incredible powers are basically combining humanity's existing knowledge. There is increasing evidence it struggles with generating new knowledge. So there, like, it cannot come up with a new idea the way human beings can. It's great at combining everything we've come up with in novel combinations, but at two trillion parameters, we may be hitting the limit of intelligible stuff with that. So, you know, can it tell you how to build every existing bioweapon? Possibly. Can it come up with a new, even deadlier one? Maybe not. All right. Who's got some questions? <laughs> I know I do too. Uh, cool. So based on my experience, like if you want to use it to get some, uh, you know, new and novel technical documentation, it can totally make up fake facts to tell you how to do something that's very specific. Uh, so you might have that, that bioweapon end up containing the flu and just, you know, infecting yourself and nobody else. But do you believe that uh, attempts to limit the ability of, uh, in, in these like special corner case guardrails on chat GPT is an example of security through obscurity and uh, like, if so, do you believe that there should be a relatively easy way for a trusted individual to opt out of it, similar to uh, CCLs. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I tend not to be a fan of security through obscurity either. Be curious to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, so you said CCL? That's an acronym. Conce oh, concealed carry license. You're talking about the world of atoms. I live in the world of bits. This material world thing, I don't know about, about it. Um, so... Some of this would be, if I knew the truth, it would be trade secrets. Okay, this is, this is, there's a lot at stake here about what OpenAI and their rivals do next and wh what they're actually doing that we don't know about. Um, I, I don't actually think that they're hi hypocrites, at least not completely. I do actually think they're really trying. At least Sam Altman seems like he's really trying to foreground ethics, where he's certainly simulating an ethical individual at a, just a very high level of virtuosity, okay? But... It's not for all the people at the guardrails, so he's doing more than zeroing, even if he's not doing enough. I mean, talk matters, what people say in public matters. Um, they've got their own stuff that they're doing, presumably without guardrails, and then there's the stuff that we can get that does have the guardrails, and then there's the jailbreak versions that are already out there. I don't think there's a jailbreak version of four. Am I wrong about that? There's one going around on the dark web that was definitely 3.5 jailbreak. Is that where you hang out when I don't see you? He, of course, security through obscurity. No one would ever think Kevin was a dark side cyberpunk. Who could have possibly imagined that? I didn't really answer your question because I don't know. Uh, it's Shanta. Uh, yeah. Sam Altman has said that he he had the intention of releasing uh, GPT 
to stir things up and disrupt things so that people would start taking AI seriously, that maybe if we can resolve this dispute over art, then we'll, you know, figure out how to resolve AI ethics issues before we get to health and military industrial issues. And we know that uh, the AI uh, art debate is totally resolved and everybody has super rational takes there. Um, I guess, yeah, th thoughts on that from Shanta or? They do seem to say things that make them seem like sober, ethical, serious people who ha have, you know, deep philosophical debates about this stuff. They, they are saying the right things from my point of view. It's very hard to know what's going on over there. And when you ask GPT about GPT-5, it's uh, notoriously tight-lipped. Um, maybe it doesn't know. Maybe they haven't trained GPT-4 on G GPT-5 knowledge because it's it, it's – most recent corpus of of uh, language that was fed into it is more than a year old. So, so GPT five didn't exist back then, or maybe they planned it. There's there's nothing to know. I I don't know. It's it's um it's uh, a mystery wrapped inside of an enigma inside of a burrito. Wasn't very helpful. And I think part of the problem too has just been that they've literally hoovered up the whole internet. They're running out of data. <laughs> Thanks. Um, and so, I mean, kind of along the lines of what you're just saying is I'm, I'm curious, uh, like how you or others are thinking about like attacks on the model itself as a potential attack vector that, you know, will exist going forward that doesn't exist now. Like, I don't know enough about the back end of how it works, but, you know, as, you know, chat GPT or Cortana or whatever, you know, big tech integrations get built into more and more kind of person facing applications, like how long would it be if somebody, you know, changed a bunch of parameters in chat GPT and that just immediately started playing through, like how long would it be if somebody noticed that realized because like that could be bad in my mind. I don't know how to kind of probability handicap that. Could, could, or, or could somebody figure out a really clever prompt injection that actually mutates the parameters in the models through some means that people smarter than me, you know, what, yeah. yeah prompt injection is the one people talk about the most. I more that it's a hypothetical problem as opposed to that there's been empirical data. That's all I've seen. The, the, the last time I kind of did a search on that stuff, it's it's a real worry because people have, I think, d demonstrated a proof of concept. There is a vulnerability with prompt uh, engineering, prompt injection. But, uh, you know, given how many companies are partnering with OpenAI as part of their platform, you know, using their API and having uh, their customers dealing with some open API components of what they're doing. Sure. I mean, it's probably a pretty serious, uh, desirable attack surface to try to figure out an atta attack vector to compromise. I think that's uh, probably what some of the most sophisticated hacker groups are thinking about right now. I think they've got an advantage that they've got so much money and they're a pretty relatively small organization and they can, you know, get Microsoft has real security expertise at this point. I mean, they, they've learned the hard way, they did things wrong for so long. They're doing things much more right. So I'm not super worried about that just yet. It, w it wouldn't be on my top 20 list of things to worry about. But this stuff, it feels like it's evolving pretty rapidly. I just want to circle back to a point you made about the existing large language models have been trained on the corpus of digital data, on like all of Wikipedia, just like tons of the stuff that's out there. And they've kind of run out, maybe not completely, but um, in terms of digital stuff online that, that you can, whatever the ethics are is a different issue, but they've just grabbed archives of most of the internet at this point. And people said like, maybe they can't really do much more. Well, the, the answer to this is that you can use other generative AI to generate simulated data. And then the question is, is that stuff going to be as good? Um, that's an, an area of active research right now is coping with the fact that there's not another internet that we can harvest, colonize, be parasitic upon, whatever, whatever it is that they do. But the point would be if the simulated data is high quality enough, that might um, get around this problem. That's an area that people are very, very actively looking at right now. 
Yeah, and I mean, you know, just a basic, uh, for those who don't know, a basic technique in machine learning is what's called data augmentation, where you can literally rotate images, change their contrast, et cetera. So there's already very known standard techniques to, like, infinitely multiply your data, though I'm sure OpenAI has already done that on most of the data they've collected. Um, yeah. okay. So regarding the, the threats that are coming in, Looking at it from first principles, you say, why are these threats happening? And it's because they're getting paid for it. And, and Owen, you've heard this thread from me before, but uh, it seems that uh, the solution to this may not be technical, but rather a regulatory solution where you make it illegal to pay ransomware. If you pay ransomware, you go to jail. You, have a, you do that in the United States, these ransomwares dry up pretty much overnight. And there's a similar... There's a similar historical analogy to this um, from the 1970s where uh, foreign gov every company who wanted to do business in a foreign company had to pay bribes to those foreign governments. And I think it was in 78, the U.S. created the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act that made it um, a criminal offense to pay a bribe to a foreign government. And so you had this massive tax on our society that was this, this, these bribes going to foreign governments that dried up pretty much overnight because of this. Right now we have this massive tax in terms of cybersecurity, in terms of funding criminal organizations in North Korea and, and rogue states. Um, that could dry up overnight if you just made this illegal to do. And um, there was actually some traction on that, that in April, the Biden administration was actually um, uh, thinking about passing a law on this. And is there, their analysis of it, of course, our, our bureaucrats are very technically competent. And they realized that they, uh, they couldn't well enough define how they could um, allow for government waivers to the paying of ransomware. And so they decided to scrap the whole thing altogether. And so, uh, <laughs> but anyway, I guess some some local municipalities. I think uh, uh, Boston was was looking into doing this. But to me, the, 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 it seems very obvious. There, it's like we're getting punched in the face, and we're teaching everybody how to best take a punch to the face instead of teaching people to just stand back and walk away. Yeah. Well, well, uh, we'll get on thoughts on that. I guess. Uh, I guess I'll just say I've uh, I've heard the debate on paying and not paying them. All I'll inject to it is. It, I don't think it's necessarily morally and ethically quite a one-to-one -one with your example of the bribes to countries like Iran in the 70s, just because with, um, especially as I think Owen can allude to, uh, ransomware, say at a hospital, you don't pay the bribe, somebody might literally die. So it's a little more ethically complicated than that scenario. But I agree it's complicated. I'm not sure how I ultimately feel on the topic. Um, Mike, Mike, I'm with you probably 80 or 90 percent of the way on this, and I, I think Kevin actually anticipated what I would add a little bit of nuance to this. So, like in the specific case of ransomware in hospitals, um, and hospital uh, operations getting shut down, we think at least one person's died already uh, for a hospital that um, was about to do a surgical procedure on a person. The hospital got shut down. They got sent to another hospital and they didn't make it in time. Uh, there's at least maybe one of these that I think there's some documentation of, but probably more than one at this point. Mm -hmm. I think it was, I think the, the one I was citing was, was Germany. The, um, in the case of life and death, you could see an ethical exception to the principle you're saying, but I'd say only in that case would I be comfortable in saying, well, this is going to be a one-time thing. The problem is, is that it's not a one-time thing when you pay the ransomware because they've got more money now. They've got more incentives. They just had their techniques validated. Um, I would like to see Travis County implement a no ransomware policy for all healthcare facilities here. I think we should, um, uh, I've talked to one of our county commissioners about AI issues. And she's very, very on it. She knows that this is a very big thing and it's Austin is one of the most important places in the world for this technology. Now, I think it would be – actually, this would be a really good t topic for a future discussion is this very point. It's like what what uh, you know, what would be the ethics of having an exception like Kevin and I would argue for like life and death? Um, I think it cuts towards our principle, but maybe uh, you want to be on a panel discussion and, and make those points. Maybe we could get a philosopher or an ethicist to help us out here too, but this would be worthy of a future – future episode of our reality show that we call EFF org. Yeah. I'd, I'd have to steal up for that debate because we definitely could get some very passionate people on that one. Um, who has not spoken yet? Who wants to speak? 
So my name is Teresa. And so I have worked with many technology companies. And so what I do know is what they're saying today is that in a lot of cases, you pay the ransom and they're not giving you back your data. So a lot of corporations are basically saying you have to have a default. We'll be thankful for NIST 2.0, which I know that the Biden or this current one has for the mid to small size frameworks. The National Institutes of Science and Technology Cybersecurity Framework. Yeah. SCI, yeah. Huh. And or how to pick a managed service provider that is competent and can do it for you, right? If you don't have people and staff. But one other thing I was going to ask is, that, is fraud GP and worm GPT or those like worm the, is the one I was thinking worm. Of. that's the jailbroken one going on. Yeah, that's right. So I knew about them, but I wasn't sure if that's what you guys are talking about. So one of the articles and like my I deal with CISA security officers is that we do have the advantage still slightly, right, for the response. So the idea of security uh obscurity that's kind of been the mo and like everybody was hush hush i'm not telling you or you what i'm doing but now what has happened over the last few years is all the enterprises are realizing um it's immunity through community so all the corporations are coming together so i think that gives us an advantage too because we can get ahead of like the zero days right but the thing with the fraud gpt and worm gpt for that dark bird i think was the one was what they're saying is it used to take them we'd get it and then they tweak it to figure out how to like get it back in and that used to take about six months they're now being able to iterate and hit you again in two months. The other weird stat that I heard was that um, like more than 50% of ransomware people get hit again with it. They hit you again in 60 days. So that is, is that independent of whether you refuse to pay or not? Yeah. Well, and I wonder sometimes if they're still like they, inside. They just re like they tell you that they pulled their software off. Yeah, they're still kind of in there. And they, they left they the back door in place. Yeah, and just yeah. Made yeah the back right. door. Yeah. 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 So, you know, so the rates are increasing. I do feel like the technology is advancing to combat and to respond. But I also, a lot of it, what they're saying is it's no longer about stealing. It's like a lot of bad actors are coming just to destroy. So back to everybody get a generator for Christmas. You know, worm GPT, that's just not as wholesome as I think they were going for. You know, it's just, just there's something about it's leaving me feeling a little unfulfilled. Worm GPT. Um, um, the feds are rolling out a framework where we don't know when it's going to hit. Uh, they're taking their time, okay? But maybe something, maybe like at least a half hour before Jesus returns, they're going to unroll this, um, where to do business with any defense department-related entity or their customers, you're going to have to have a much higher level of um, security practices built in already. And if you don't get a certification, you won't be able to, to you know, get any of that sweet, sweet defense money. Um the, the SEC will probably do it faster and better. I got to say, the finance is where tech actually that's good gets done, and, and actually in something like a timely fashion. So that's good because they pioneer this stuff, and then you know the the um, well in some ways less well resourced um, uh, um, governmental agencies can kind of look at see what their best practices were. So maybe we're going to get through this decade. My thought was. We maybe by the end of this decade, the situation would turn around and we would have better cybersecurity and we would just have a really, really rough roller coaster where some power plants would get shut off and some like tragic stuff happens. That's still my prediction, but I think the, the AI advantage that I hope we have maybe is going to mitigate that. Um, so, uh, more questions, or we can actually also go to there's a cafe downstairs. Cafe with the bar and kind of overpriced, but there's there's, there's that one item that wasn't. What was that one item? The tater tots are not overpriced, and they're 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 tasty. So, any other observations? Thank you. Yo, that's Justin, my my new buddy. He does great writing on many topics, including tech. Thanks for thanks for having me. Appreciate it. I, I wanted to introduce one data point to the discussion and ask you if you have any riffs on what it might represent. Uh, some people have been noticing that the CAPTCHAs are getting much more difficult. 
And this, I think, raises a really interesting bigger question that's relevant to your talk, Owen, which is basically, you know, as the arms race between the good and the bad actors continues, there might be increasing negative externalities for humans. If the problem really is sorting out humans from machines, and the machines are now human level, but possibly even superhuman level sooner soon enough, then is there a risk of our entire economy and society pretty much becoming uninhabitable for mere human level intelligence as the good guys try to keep out the bad guys in our software systems? So I just thought that was, I, I'm curious to know what your what your priors are on that and if you if, what you think about that. Whether or not it's sentient, are we doomed? So there is a, a, almost a prophecy on this topic from the uh, kind of progressive and hard rock band Styx. Their song, their song Mr. Roboto. Yes. They say, Machines to rule our lives. Machines dehumanize. Yeah, so the answer is yes. Um, you're an accelerationist or an accelerationist adjacent person. Acceleration is curious. Um, yeah, it, it does feel like we're moving into a period where it's going to be harder and harder to just get your stuff done because of the, the threat environment. Now, the first time I gave a talk on this stuff was at a party we had, um, and I was kind of a little more booster-ish about, here's what we can do. We can use two-factor authentication. And uh, the futurist um, Bruce Sterling came on after me, and he was kind of gently critical of where I was coming from. He was basically saying, Two-factor authentication is not going to save us. We've got to rethink this thing from first principles because we spend so much time like, what is my password? Why did I change my pass password when I was drinking last night? It's a real problem. So I know this. We've, we've got to get a much more humane uh, space going with this tech. Of course, we're, we're weaponizing it against each other. But yeah, where does this thing go? I, I think your intu your intu intuition on this is spot on, and I will ha I have a cryptic reply to this from Brian Eno, who famously said, "The problem with computers is there's not enough Africa in them." Yo, I've wondered what that means. Well, I mean, I can certainly say that um, you know I think you know to OpenAI's credit, they clearly have thought about some of the ethics. But you know, to that end, you know, you want to get more African and maybe listen to Tim Gabru and Stochastic Parrots a little more, possibly. So, yeah, maybe we can end on that thought. <laughs> um, anyway, thank you all for coming. It's been great. If any of you need a parking voucher, um, I have them, so I can give them to you. And yeah, we're probably all going to go downstairs and hang out in the lobby bar if you want to join us. And as Owen said, if you buy him a drink, you can actually debate if the dang thing's sentient or not. It's not, but it's fun. <laughs> so yeah, we'll see you all there. <laughs> And thank you to Capital Factory, Capital Factory, wherever you all are. Thank you so much. Next month, my friend Peter Wang from Anaconda is coming. You all want to be there. Peter's really brilliant. He's amazing. <laughs>